Lobby Day, we'll be putting all the advocacy training that we went through yesterday to practice by lobbying for the Climate Action Rebate Act of 2019, which prices carbon such that greenhouse gas emitters would have to pay per metric ton of emissions. We view this as a tool to substantially cut carbon emissions and as a solution to addressing the climate crisis that we do have the potential to see past after the 2020 elections. We just have to put in the grassroots work now to see Congress take this important step. So clearly this is the time to act and I'm so grateful to all of you for being with us for that. Uh, yesterday, we also went over the power of our own stories as we prepare to share them on our lobby visits tomorrow. Now, thankfully, we have many, many resources on our website, fcnl.org slash SLW, that you can check out if you missed some of the content yesterday. You can find the Leave Behind, which has all of the basics of the Climate, Re uh, the Climate Action Rebate Act of 2019. And you can also find a background sheet with more details and the lobby visit roadmap to help you plan your lobby visit. So when you get on fcnl.org slash SLW, you will see a couple tabs up at the top and I would click on virtual lobbying and then resources and downloads. So a lot of what you may have missed yesterday or you just want refreshed on, you will find in these two tabs. So I really encourage you to kind of click around and make sure you're comfortable with all the resources that are there. Um, but if you're not, for some reason, at the end of our time today, from 2.40 p.m. to 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern, our climate lobbyists, Emily Warsva and Alicia Cannon, will be sticking around for some sort of uh, virtual office hours uh, where they can answer any questions that you might still have about the legislation. But any questions that you have about your lobby visit, uh, details of when it is, how to actually get on the call, you should send those to Justin Hurdle, who is a staff member here at FCNL. So his email address is J-H-U-R-D-L-E. That's Justin Hurdle, J-H-U-R-D-L-E at FCNL.org. You can find his information on our Spring Lobby Weekend website pretty easily as well. Uh, speaking of FCNL staff and the amazing team that has been working to put this together, I do wanna reintroduce Bobby and Annie, who will be monitoring our pages that I'm sure you are all checking out right now. So we have Annie, hi Annie, um, on Facebook, and we have Bobby on um, YouTube. So do you both want to say hi? Hi. I'm excited hi. to be here at Facebook headquarters again. <laughs> um, I'm proud to say that Vicki Bledsoe, my mom, has tuned in on Facebook. So I know we have at least one viewer. Uh, here on the live thread. Okay, good. <laughs> and over on the YouTube, over on the YouTube side of things, we've got about a hundred people on the line right now from all over the place: Orange County, California, Wilmington College, Ohio, Greensboro, North Carolina. Tons of shout-outs going on. That's awesome. So if you are on YouTube or Facebook, please make sure that you're chatting with us. Bobby and Annie will be there to hopefully chat you back or answer any questions that you have and definitely let us know if they see anything that we need to address in the comments um, from all of you. So uh, today I wanna go over what, what we're gonna expect. We're really going to refine the advocacy skills that we learned yesterday, and we're gonna dive even deeper into the climate crisis. First up, we have remarks from a member of Congress, um, and then we do have a congressional staff panel which uh, both of these um, sessions, we hope, will give you a better understanding of life on the Hill and how policy ideas and legislation are moved. After that, at 1 p.m. Eastern is when we start our workshops. You can find the workshops listed on the website. Again, fcnl.org slash SLW. Um, you can click on the schedule tab if you want, but when you get onto that main site, you should very quickly see the entire schedule and how it is that you can click on to get into each of these workshops when the time comes. So again, there will be three slots of workshops with each slot having three workshops running at the same time. We gave you lots to choose from, from 1 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. Eastern. We have the Environment Quakers and Faith Partners, 
where you can explore how your faith might lead you to care for the environment, amplify your advocacy break into the media where hopefully you will learn how to get published on issues that you care about, and talking to conservative members of Congress about carbon pricing. Uh, which I think is self-explanatory, um, but I wanna highlight this one because we are excited to welcome some special guests um, who will be uh, taking us through some talking points on how to actually speak to conservative members about this issue. From 1.30 p.m. to 2 p.m., we have workshops that, Eastern time, we have workshops that explore the intersectionality of climate change and other issues. Um, I'm especially excited about this slot of workshops because I really hope that they'll get you all thinking more critically about your stories and why you specifically care about advocating for solutions to the climate crisis. Um, and you can see them there. We have climate change and immigration, climate change and public health, um, and, and the, there are a couple more coming up actually. So from 2 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. Eastern, we have climate change and mass incarceration, Show Me the Money, the Economics of Carbon Pricing with a speaker from Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, we'll get into the wonky stuff related to carbon pricing if you're interested. And finally, From the Hill to Your Hometown Advocacy Corps, which you should definitely attend if you're interested in applying for our advocacy training program. Um, that is the program that I specifically run here, so I'm very excited about it, and I hope you are all interested in continuing to do this work when you get back home. Uh, so like I said um, earlier, uh, at the end of these workshops, there will be some office hours at 2.40 p.m. Eastern with our climate lobbyists. And I'm not sure if you remember from yesterday, but Bobby, our program assistant for Quaker Outreach, let us know that there will be an opportunity for silent worship in community right after the office hours are over at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so both the office hours and the silent worship will happen via a Zoom link like our trainings happened yesterday. So those Zoom links you can find on the website as well, fcnl.org slash slw. You have to kind of scroll down through the schedule and once you get to that part of the schedule, it'll say join via Zoom, click on it at the right time and there will be people waiting for you to either answer your questions or uh, join you in silent worship. Um, so that's gonna be the end of our time together today. But tomorrow we are excited that you all will be lobbying and we are especially excited to hear back about your lobby visits. If you take any pictures on the, um, oh, I, I, well, I, I guess you wouldn't be here, but if you're, if you're with someone on the call, like it's you and another person, take a picture and keep sending us those pictures of you lobbying and participating with other people um, because we love them. We got a bunch of them yesterday. And so if you take any more pictures, send them to quakerlobby at gmail.com. They were awesome yesterday. Keep it up. And um, remember that every single visit needs to have one report back form done. So uh, you can assign someone in your group to complete that. It is, it is extremely important that you're filling out this form. This is how you can report to us what is being said in your congressional offices uh, so that we in our work and Emily and Leash in their work can lobby even more effectively after this event is over. And you can find this form on our website as well, fcnl.org slash slw within those resources that I mentioned. Now, before I hand things over to Emily to get us started with some of our awesome speakers, I do wanna remind you all to be sharing on social media. I just mentioned, if you're taking any pictures, send them to us. Um, but if you're posting on social media, please use the hashtags, hashtag Spring Lobby Weekend and hashtag Act on Climate and tag us on Instagram, Twitter, and or Facebook. And remember to be chatting with each other and with Annie and Bobby on both Facebook and YouTube. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw things over to Emily, our climate change lobbyist, who's gonna get us started for the day. Thank you so much, Emily. Hi everyone, uh, I am so excited to be with you all a second day. Thank you so much for coming back. And if it's your first day, uh, welcome. Um, like we talked about yesterday, this is a really important moment to be lobbying for climate solutions. We know that we are currently living through a health emergency, and this is the greatest crisis right now. Um, we hope you all are staying safe, 
Um, this is why we made this decision to make our conference a virtual conference. Um, there's lots of really immediate concerns that Congress is dealing with, um, whether that's providing hospitals with the supplies that they need, um, working to create jobs, figuring out the long-term health of our economy. And at the same time, we're also still trying to figure out the long-term changes we're going to need to address yet another crisis, uh, the climate crisis. Um, so as we've seen from COVID-19, what happens in other parts of the world also affects us here in the US. These issues are global and they're interconnected. Um, and that's the same that's happening with the climate emergency. It's a global problem. Um, and that's why federal US action to address climate change has to be part of the global solution, um, which is why your lobby visits tomorrow are just so critically important. Um, whatever we do, um, we know that we must be thinking about longer term climate solutions. Um, and we have to be working to stop the carbon pollution on this earth um, that we've been emitting. Um, so I think as we work with our leaders to respond to the health crisis right now, we hope it'll also inspire us to think about ways to address the climate crisis. So as a reminder, for your lobby visits tomorrow, you're going to be asking your members of Congress to support the Climate Action Rebate Act. Um, this is a bill that will place a $15 per metric ton price on carbon emissions and will increase by $15 every single year. As a reminder, the revenue is used for a variety of purposes, including 70% returned to low and middle income households as a dividend. Um, revenue is also used to help workers transition away from a fossil fuel economy. It's used to invest in infrastructure and clean energy research and development. Um, I am personally thrilled that we were able to get a video from Congressman Jimmy Panetta, who is the lead sponsor in the House of the Climate Action Rebate Act. So I wanna briefly introduce the Congressman before we play this video. Congressman Panetta represents California's 20th district and he's currently serving his second term in Congress. His district includes Monterey and San Benito counties um, and parts of Santa Cruz and Santa Clara counties. He currently serves on the House Committee on Ways and Means Congressman Panetta is also a member of the Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus, where he is quite an active member, really dedicated to building bipartisan relationships and action across the aisle um, to support a number of climate solutions. So we are so excited to hear his special message for us, um, the Spring Lobby Weekend participants, um, and the great work you are all about to do. So I'm going to ask that that video gets queued up, um, and let's listen to the remarks from Congressman Panetta. Hello, I'm Congressman Jimmy Panetta. I represent the 20th Congressional District, uh, otherwise known as the Central Coast of California, otherwise as I've known it, as my home. Uh, as you can tell, I am not in my home as I attempt to film this video. I am at my desk in Washington, D.C. I took the red eye in yesterday in order to vote on a stimulus package that uh, I don't think we've ever seen the size of something like that before in our history. And we had to do that because we are in the battle against something that I don't think many of us have ever experienced before, and that's dealing with this COVID-19 pandemic. But what it does demonstrate to me, and I think it will demonstrate to you, is that Democrats and Republicans can actually come together in dealing with crises. And that's why I wanna take this time to thank you for making sure that Democrats and Republicans come together in dealing with our climate crisis. Now, one of the tools that we can use in order to come together and fight against climate change is the Climate Action Rebate Plan, a bill that I, along with Senator Chris Coons, uh, worked together on to uh, author and put forward, which I believe is a practical, is a reasonable, is a feasible way in which we can reduce our carbon emissions. Clearly the number one thing to help fight against climate change. Now, it puts a fee on our carbon output and then that fee will then lead us to 100% emission reductions by 2050. Now, that is something that I believe is a reasonable timeline and is something that's practical and most importantly is doable and we can do it with this legislation. 
But what also, um, what also I think you need to remember and to highlight in your discussions with other people, with other members of Congress, is that this isn't about just placing a fee on carbon emissions. This is about then taking that fee and reinvesting it in our country, reinvesting it in communities that are the most vulnerable to climate change. That's right. 70% of the fees are going to be put into low and middle income families. But we're not going to stop there. And that's what's important about this legislation. That's what actually distinguishes this legislation from other tools that are out there. Because what we do is we take part of that fee and put it back into research and development for new technologies that are more accessible and more affordable for everybody. We take a portion of that fee and put it back into climate resilient infrastructure. And then we take a portion of that fee and put it back into transition assistance for fossil fuel workers. Because I've always said, I don't do legislation. I don't create legislation. I don't pass legislation to hurt families. You want to help families. And I believe it's in that transition phase in which we have to extend that assistance to those members of the fossil fuel industry to let them know that this is how we can transition you out of fossil fuels into the clean energy industry. And that's what I, I believe this bill does. And so I want to thank you. I want to thank you for coming together with the Friends Committee on National Legislation and working to grow support for the Climate Action Rebate Plan. This is a bill that I do believe it's going to take you not just advocating for, it's going to take you coming together on. It's going to take Democrats and Republicans coming together to support this type of legislation that I believe is the appropriate step forward when it comes to battling against the crisis of climate change. But that's what it's going to take. And that's why I want to express my appreciation to you uh, in this video, uh, to you, uh, hopefully after we get through these times when we can actually meet in person, when I actually can shake your hand, when we get back to normalcy, uh, to make sure that we continue the fight against the climate crisis. I want to thank you. I want to let you know that what you are doing, even at this time, and making sure that there are others out there who understand how important it is that we keep up the battle against the climate crisis, uh, how important it is that we advocate for pieces of legislation like the Climate Action Rebate Plan, how important it is going forward and how important it will continue to be uh, once we get back to normal uh, here in Washington, D.C., here in our nation and throughout the world, because it's our world that we're fighting for. It's our climate that we are fighting for. And most importantly, by you advocating for the Climate Action Rebate Plan, you're advocating for our future. And that's why I thank you. I wish you good luck. And I can't wait to see you soon. Thank you. Wow, that was really awesome. Um, a huge thanks to Congressman Panetta uh, for sending us that message and really inspiring us all as we go out and lobby tomorrow. Um, so thanks so much. And I'm very excited that in just a few moments, we're going to have a congressional staff panel with two staffers that I work with closely. Um, but before we do that, we're gonna have a really quick 30 second commercial break. So take a quick stretch and I will see you all very soon. All right, welcome back everyone. I am so excited for our next set of speakers. Uh, we're going to hear from several congressional staff that I have the privilege of working with closely on climate issues in Congress. Um, especially, we are so appreciative of the time that they're giving us right now, um, especially in light of the rapidly evolving situation with COVID-19. Um, so first, I'm excited to welcome Corey Schrote, who is the Legislative Director for Congressman Francis Rooney, who represents Florida's 19th district. Corey has over nine years of legislative experience and has leveraged that background to help establish Congressman Rooney as a leading Republican on the environment, energy, and climate issues. 
Um, Corey has coordinated the strategy for extending the congressional moratorium on offshore drilling in the Eastern Gulf of Mexico. Corey has also worked tirelessly to support the Climate Solutions Caucus, which Congressman Rooney currently co-chairs. He's also worked very closely on carbon pricing. Congressman Rooney is actually co-sponsoring four different carbon pricing bills in Congress. Um, I'm also thrilled that we're gonna be joined by Ria Mehta, who leads the climate change portfolio for Congressman Jimmy Panetta, who we just heard from a few moments ago. Um, so his name should be very familiar with you as Congressman Panetta is the lead sponsor in the House of the bill that we are all lobbying on tomorrow, the Climate Action Rebate Act. Um, Ria's portfolio includes agriculture, the environment, energy, and infrastructure issues. And before joining Congressman Panetta's office, Ria served as a legislative fellow with the U.S. Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry under ranking member Debbie Stabenow, where she helps negotiate the 2018 Farm Bill. So we are so excited um, to both of you all for joining us today. So thank you and welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, great. So I think um, the first question I'm going to ask is actually to Ria. So Ria, can you speak a little bit about why Congressman Panetta decided to introduce the Climate Action Rebate Act? Um, why carbon pricing legislation as a solution? Um, and then maybe can you talk to us about how you all tried to protect a number of different vulnerable communities as you drafted this bill? Sure. So Congressman Panetta and I have had several conversations as we uh, think about climate change and, and the best ways for Congress to address this crisis. And something that he's always said from day one is that carbon pricing has to be part of the solution. And I think we all know that we need a comprehensive solution to climate change and carbon pricing isn't the end all be all or the silver bullet, but it's a pretty big piece. And I think that putting a price on carbon is possibly the single biggest single action that we could do to really move the needle on climate change. And so in all our conversations, you know, it, it kept coming to the forefront. I think the other piece for us is that carbon, uh, is that my boss is on the Ways and Means Committee. So this legislation uh, goes directly through our committee. And as you mentioned earlier, there are several other uh, carbon pricing bills out there, including Mr. Rooney's bill. And, and I think there's seven or eight other bills out there now, which is awesome. Um, and you know, if, if you look at all these bills, they're, they're more similar than different. And I think that it's awesome that so many members are on the record supporting carbon pricing. But as all these bills do go through the Ways and Means Committee, I think my boss felt that it was important for him to put out his ideal version of carbon pricing. Um, and, and so that's what we worked on. Uh, you mentioned the transition assistance piece. I think that that was really critical for us and, and our uh, Senate counterparts, um, Senator Coons and Feinstein, that was a big part of the conversation we had in drafting this bill together. Um, as you know that, you know, we wanted to have that direct dividend back to low and middle income American families, but there are also communities that currently rely on the fossil fuel industry for their livelihoods. And they are going to need a different type of assistance going forward. Um, I think that there's a great article in the Washington Post about Kern County, which is in California, not in our district, but a really great example of a community that relied almost exclusively on oil production, but now is part of California's uh, leading counties when it comes to solar, because a lot of those skills are transferable to the solar industry. But you know, you, you need to help communities through that transition. So we wanted to make that a piece of the bill. Awesome, thank you so much. That's really exciting to, to hear a little bit more about the thought process there. Um, I'd like to ask Corey a question now. Um, so Corey, wondering if you could speak to us a little bit about why Congressman Rooney, who is a Republican, supports carbon pricing um, and how you all see carbon pricing as part of the climate solution. Absolutely. Thank you, Emily. And uh, it's, it's great to be here. Um, Congressman Rooney has uh, a long um, history of, of being in the environment, of sailing, of uh, just being generally outdoors. And uh, that combined with, uh, he's, he's a voracious reader, 
and uh, just loves uh, loves consuming any uh, data point that you can give him. Um, he's read the uh, the IPCC report. Um, he's read the uh, inner um, interagency climate assessment. Um, he read the summary uh, that came out a year and a half ago. And uh, ju just through reading those, listening to scientists, listening to um, various folks uh, that, that are taking a hard look at this, came to the conclusion that we needed to do something drastic and, and, uh, and something that would be effective at reducing our, our, uh, our emissions. Uh, that's how he landed on a carbon tax. Um, and, and much to Rhea's point, um, it's not about uh, who's whose idea is best it's about getting the getting a carbon tax in place and finding the, I, there's there's a robust debate that can be had about what you do with the carbon tax uh proceeds how you re-inject that back into the economy um but the key really is to get that price of carbon to send that market signal to uh to to drive down carbon emissions um it's one of the lowest bars we have, uh, just incentivizing the transition from um, fossil fuels to uh, even if it's interim, cleaner fossil fuels, natural gas, things like that are going to be part of um, the short term solution with the goal of 2050 being carbon neutral um, uh, from certainly the energy uh, space. But we do see that um, we're going to have to expand into manufacturing and, and uh, other areas as well. But that's going to require a lot of different solutions. And this is just one piece of the puzzle. Great. Thank you. Um, that's really helpful. Um, so Corey and Ria, just so you know, we have um, several hundred uh, young people who have joined us for this weekend. And um, we're really excited that there's still um, we still have many, many lobby visits taking place tomorrow via, via phone. Um, and so all of these people will be speaking um, to congressional staff like yourselves about the Climate Action Rebate Act, about carbon pricing, about why they care personally about climate change. And so I'm wondering, um, knowing that carbon pricing is kind of a wonky issue, if you could each um, give some advice to our audience about what really makes an effective constituent lobby visit on carbon pricing in particular. you know. What tips or advice might you have for everyone, knowing that they're all going to be having these phone calls on carbon pricing tomorrow? So maybe uh, Rio, we'll start with you. Sure, and I'll I'll start off by giving you all a big thank you from myself, and you already heard from my boss, but I'll say it again: we are so incredibly excited that you guys are lobbying on the Climate Action Rebate Act, and um, and I think yeah, it's it's a tricky time to have these conversations when there's something bigger uh, or something different <laughs> going on. But I think as, as Emily said earlier, we need to keep beating the drum on this. Um, and, and when it comes to a successful lobby visit, I think you all are already well equipped as young people um, who can talk about how this will impact your future. Um, I think the other piece of any lobby visit that I always find compelling is when someone has a personal story to tell. Um, we have so many conversations in DC that are just kind of passing papers, you know, sign this, co-sponsor this. Um, but I think that it's really great when folks come in and, and really explain why, why do you care about this? Why is this important to you? Um, and, and I think with climate change, everyone does have a story. So as much as you can focus on that, um, and then obviously also talk about the bill. I think that's what makes something really affect, what makes a visit effective. I think also following up is really effective. Um, if someone, you know, gets to talk to you and you have a great conversation and then the next day they get an email from you and they get to re-remember that conversation, um, it's super helpful. Um, great, thank you. That's, that's really good advice. And we have, we've already been prepping people to make sure they send a follow-up email with more information. So that's great confirmation of that, why that's so important to you all as staffers. Um, Corey, wondering if you could also share a little bit about what makes a really effective constituent lobby visit, um, especially on, on carbon pricing. Yeah, I mean, I, just echoing Rhea's points, I mean, that, that personal touch, the personal story, the reminder that, uh, 
you know, there's something beyond just the uh, next five years that, uh, that, that folks our age um, and younger are going to have to live here and deal with the consequences of what we're doing today. Um, it, 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 it resounds with a lot of, a lot of folks. Um, I think uh, that's a story that my boss has tried to tell and tried to express to, uh, to his colleagues, especially on the Republican side of the aisle is, hey, why don't you go ask your, your grandkids what they think about this? Ask your kids um, and, uh, and, and just see how they feel about it. See how they feel about, um, you know, what their outlook is. Uh, I think that's been helpful from our perspective. Uh, I think positivity is, is key. Um, nobody's been convinced to get on to uh, a bill or sign on to an idea by being beat over the head and told that they're, uh, they're foolish and, and, and that sort of thing. And uh, so I think uh, just encouragement and, uh, and positivity uh, that you bring to these meetings can be really helpful. Uh, I know it can get discouraging at times, but uh, I, I do promise that there are plenty of staff who listen, do take your concerns down, um, and, and the follow-up is key. Uh, the follow-up is, is an excellent suggestion, recommendation. Um, just keeping that dialogue going, reminding them that you were there and, uh, and keeping engaged in the process. Great, thank you, Corey. Um, this has been such helpful information. Um, I know that we had a couple of students who are really excited to ask a couple of questions as well. So I'm gonna hand it over to Larissa now who um, will be able to help facilitate a couple of those questions that we have um, coming in from the audience. So Larissa. Thank you, Emily. And uh, thank you both for sharing your experience with us. I do have some questions for you. So first we have a question from Alyssa Vandenbark from Haverford College in Philadelphia. Alyssa, thank you so much for being here to ask a question. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm hoping to get a better sense of what impact our lobbying really has on Capitol Hill. I know a lot of us go into a meeting and we talk to people and we're not really sure what happens after that. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to what happens within the congressional office after the lobby visit ends in terms of what pieces of information get passed along to different people. And in order for lobbying, lobbying on a specific issue to make a bigger impact in an office, is it better to have a higher volume of like visits or calls or, or contacts? Or is it really just most important that personal touch, the higher quality? Thank you. Um, so uh, why don't we start with, I wanna give you both an opportunity to answer the question. Uh, unless one of you is really, really wanting to start, maybe we can start with Rhea? Sure. Okay. Um, great question. Uh, and I think it's it's awesome that you guys are thinking so critically about what makes lobbying effective. Um, I think that's that's already doing so much more than than a lot of other groups do. Um, I think that the question of quality versus quantity uh, it, it kind of depends on on the situation. But in general, I find that when a group comes in and they have 10 bills that they are talking about, it, it can be a bit overwhelming rather than, you know, one or two pieces of legislation that allow you to talk about, you know, why your member should support that bill, but then also gives you that time to tell your personal story. Um, I think that tends to be more effective. Um, in terms of the frequency, of outreach. Uh, I think echoing what Corey said earlier, keeping that dialogue with the staffer is always really helpful. And, um, you know, I, I never uh, think that I get too many emails from our advocates, whether it be, you know, our uh, climate advocates, or I also do the agriculture portfolio. And I feel like the advocates who I'm closest with, who I work with all the time are the ones who are constantly sending me emails and I love it. I, I don't ever think it's overkill. Um, and I think that just kind of making sure you're touching back with folks, um, as you guys know, on the Hill, we are constantly bombarded with hundreds of different things. And especially in the house, um, each staffer will be responsible for several different issues. So you're probably talking to someone who doesn't spend their entire day thinking about carbon pricing, even if they wish they were. Um, 
So, you know, just doing what you can to keep that issue at the forefront uh, is, is always helpful. Thank you, Ria. And what about you, Corey? What do you have to say to that question? Alyssa, I think this is a fantastic question. And uh, I, I, think it, I think it really comes down to uh, you need both. You need uh, a good show of support. And, uh, and, and that's where um, when you have fly-ins, when you have community meetings where, where you bring a bunch of folks and share personal stories, um, I think that's a huge help. But then having that uh, follow up, be a little more one on one, whether it's uh, you as the advocate or, or, um, you know, in my dialogue with Emily, on a regular basis is, uh, is extremely important to dig into the details of whatever it is we're working on. So uh, I think that there's, there's two different answers to that question. I think you really do need both um, to, to be an effective uh, effective at lobbying on your, uh, on your issue. Um, I also, uh, would say that, um, I, well, the, yeah, I, I think that's the, the key, um, is having both of those areas covered just, uh, uh, a good group, um, good quantity, uh, and then really good direct follow up, um, whether it's in person or over the phone or on the call. And yeah, there's no, there's no limit to, don't, I, I wouldn't recommend emailing somebody every day. Um, but if you reach out and, and uh, just kind of have a, a, an open dialogue. And, and the other part is the, uh, the process. Every office is completely different in what their structure looks like. Um, in my office, uh, it, it's relatively streamlined. Um, I'm able to take whatever I, uh, I speak with, um, with a constituent and go talk to the congressman directly if I think it's relevant. Um, some offices, you have a chain of three or four people that it has to work its way through. Um, sometimes it has to get kicked down to the district staff. I don't think it would be inappropriate to ask for a general outline like, you know, what are, what are the next steps? Um, and I think that uh, the staffer or the member that you're meeting with can give you a, uh, a, a an estimate of, you know, I, I got to talk to the member, I got to talk to the chief of staff, I have to talk to some other stakeholders in our district. Um, and, you know, this might take a week, this might take three weeks, maybe their process is a little bit longer, I don't know. Um, but I don't think it's a totally inappropriate question to uh, to ask, uh, you know, what are next steps and what what should I be able to expect? Thank you. And thank you for that advice about asking for kind of like a actual outline of where that information goes and when. Um, that's something that we talk a lot about, you know, when you talk to a district office, where does that information go? Um, and so thank you for kind of encouraging us to just ask. Um, yeah. I have another person that wants to ask you a question. We have Juan Avila from New Mexico. Juan, are you there? Hi, guys. Hi. Thank you for Hi. being here. Uh, as Larissa was saying, my name is Juan Avila. I'm from New Mexico. This is my second time in Spring Lobby and uh, definitely my first virtual lobby. Uh, and I'm part of the Advocacy Corps here in New Mexico. Um, and my question is for both of you guys, some advice you could uh, possibly offer us. Uh, as an advocacy court member, I'm in charge of taking fellow New Mexicans to lobby our representatives and senators. More often than not, uh, I would say uh, pretty close to most of the time, it's uh, uh, the staff that we're talking with. Um, and something that we struggle with uh, uh, with our senators is, gen uh, at least in my case, it's been where my senator and representative is already in support of the bill that we're working with. And uh, more often than not, we find ourselves strategizing some new asks that we could ask uh, our offices to do. And often one thing we do uh, ask them is to be more vocal about the issue, like on social media or in interviews, or whenever possible to talk to colleagues or attempt to push the agenda forward. Uh, I would like to know from all uh, both of you, is this an effective ask to ask the offices or is there something else you would suggest for an effective uh, lobbying when uh, a bill isn't being moved? Thank you so much, Juan. And I think this time we can start with Corey. Sure. 
I think uh, I, I think that it's absolutely um, you need to be pushing ahead and 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 really pushing forward in uh, whatever issue area you're you're working on. Um, I go back to positivity is fantastic. Uh, really, just that encouragement from your uh, from your constituents, from your the advocates and stakeholders in your uh, state and district are really key to helping you turn around as from a staff point of view and go to the member or go to the committee and say, hey, I have people that are still asking about this. We want to work. How do we how do we move this ahead? It, it can give us an excuse. It can give us a, a reason to really circle back with uh, with folks and try and move the ball forward, whether it's uh, whether it's because they're already working on something that you want or you need the net, you're looking at the next thing. Um, I think that uh, the best way to to be effective is just uh, just continue to be advocates and and be positive moving forward. Uh, Ria, do you have any advice for Juan based off of his question? Yeah, great question, by the way, Juan. Um, I think, yeah, building on what Corey said, the committee process is kind of the next step. You know, if a member co-sponsors a bill, then it needs to have a hearing and a markup in the relevant committees of jurisdiction. So, you know, if you were coming to talk to my boss and and you wanted him to support the Climate Action Rebate Act, but he was already supporting it because he introduced it, I think the next step is asking him, well, have you spoken with the Ways and Means Committee? Have you spoken with Chairman Neal about doing a hearing on this bill or marking this bill up? Or what can we do to help you um, as you talk to your committee members and as you talk to the chairman about you know, moving this bill forward? Uh, I think that you know, showing that you understand the legislative process and all the steps it takes for a bill to become a law and you know, plugging yourself into those steps can be really helpful. There's so many people that come lobby and ask for co-sponsors or try to get a bill introduced, but the percentage of bills that get introduced compared to the percentage of bills that get signed into law is, you know, really, really tiny. So you really need to help it through every step of the way. So, you know, if you can go talk to Energy and Commerce Committee, Ways and Means, and and also show them that that you um, want to see this bill move forward, I think that's that's really helpful when you're talking to an office that is already right. supportive. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks again, Juan, for asking that question. It looks like we have another question coming from Facebook. So I'll turn it over to Annie so that she can uh, make sure that that question is asked as well. Hi, thanks, Larsa. So Bobby had to jump off because she's getting all set for the workshops in, uh, that are gonna start in about 15 minutes. So I actually have a question here from YouTube from Eric Lundquist, Lundquist from Wilmington, Ohio. He asks, uh, Corey, working in a Republican office, what are some of the greatest obstacles to overcome when working with other Republican offices about carbon pricing? Thanks from Wilmington College. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's a great question. Uh, and it's a very fair question. Um, the biggest obstacle is that uh, Republicans have an allergic reaction anytime you discuss taxes um, and increasing taxes. Uh, now, the reality is when you walk through the, the various bills that we've worked on, and, and uh, uh, I think that this does include uh, Congressman Panetta's bill, that um, these aren't simply a tax and take. These are, these are bills that reinvest in the economy, whether it's rebates to, uh, to back to citizens, um, whether it's eliminating uh, motor fuels tax or decreasing payroll taxes there's usually some kind of return that the consumer will see on the other side of it. All, the, all that this is, when you boil it down, is a uh, market signal to prioritize cleaner technologies over dirty ones. Um, it, it takes a little while to have that conversation and, and get our colleagues to wrap their minds around it, but we've been having some very fruitful conversations, and I think as the uh, as the age of Congress uh, kind of gets a little younger, a little bit newer, um, we've had some really good conversations with our colleagues 
and I think staff plays a big role in it too. Um, when folks are our age, uh, I think that they have more of a, a, an open-mindedness to realizing what kind of issue this is. And so if you find somebody, uh, and there's plenty of my Republican colleagues out there who understand climate change and understand the need for deep decarbonization, uh, I think that those people are, uh, are are going to be your biggest advocates advocates on the inside of an office. Thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you both again for being here to share your experience and give us some insider tips on how to lobby more effectively from people that we could potentially be lobbying, right? So uh, thank you again. And I hope you are both taking care of yourselves. Of course, thank you. Thank you. All right, so in a couple moments, uh, we are gonna kind of close out. And I told you all yesterday that if you had a story that you wanted to practice, to pretty please practice it and record it and send it to us so that we can also hear your story. And we did get a couple. So in a couple moments, uh, we are gonna hear from Kennedy, who is an Advocacy Corps member in Mississippi. But before that, I really wanted to emphasize something that I heard uh, from the panel. So I think it was Ria was saying that, you know, they are really used to having conversations that are just passing paper back and forth, right? That's kind of how she said it. Uh, asking people to co-sponsor the legislation, to take a look at these briefings or whatever else. Um, but we aren't gonna do that, right? We are not there to just pass paper. We are there to tell our stories. And I think we heard both of them say just how impactful that can be. Um, even if it is, I think, uh, to break up the monotony of all the paper and whatever else that they have to deal with, our stories do break through and our stories are remembered by staffers. Um, and you also heard her say that everyone has a story. And yesterday we were talking about how, um, you know, climate change stories can maybe be difficult if you don't think that it's been personally impacting you. Um, the answer is it probably has in some way, but you know, there's a lot of ways to say what your story is. And that's why we hopefully gave you a lot of tools in order to actually come up with one. But I just really want to emphasize that everyone has a story. If you can't come up with one just yet, it will come to you because it is there. Uh, there is a reason that you care about climate change and it's going to be important for our legislators and their staffers to hear those reasons. So uh, for now, we are going to hear another story, and maybe this will actually get you thinking even more about yours. From Kennedy, like I said, she is an Advocacy Corps member, Kennedy Taylor Henry. Uh, she is an Advocacy Corps member in Mississippi, and uh, we are going to hear from her now. Hello, all. My name is Kennedy Henry, and I'm from Jackson, Mississippi. And today I'm going to share with you my personal story. So I remember about maybe five, even 10 years ago, Mississippi received a lot of rainfall and it was pretty consistent throughout the seasons. You know, um, when you'd have a lot of rainfall and when it, there would be a little bit of rainfall. And because we live in an area where we experience the hurricane season, um, rainfall is too much, is to be expected pretty much all the time. So um, to date, <laughs> recently, as far as this week goes, um, we've received high temperatures and even low levels of rain where it should be raining a lot. Um, and so that is how climate change has affected us. And I am concerned personally because for Mississippi, agriculture is huge for us. And so when we don't get a lot of rainfall or some, experience, some areas experience too much rainfall and other areas too little rainfall, it affects the crops that we have. And so what we are petitioning our members of Congress to do is to take an action on climate change now while we can limit the effects of climate change on our climate and on our crops. Because agriculture is so huge for the state of Mississippi, not only does it affect the farmers, but it affects the workers of Mississippi. It affects the income of Mississippians. And so we are petitioning them heavily to make sure that we will still have our crops intact, our jobs intact, and the lives of our citizens intact. Thank you, FCNL. And I hope that you guys have a great day of lobbying. Bye. 
Thank you to Kennedy for sending us that video. And I think we have another one from Kate Young. Uh, she is a student at Houghton College in upstate New York. And she also sent us a video telling us her story. So we'll hear from her. Hi, my name is Caitlin Young and I'm a senior biology student at Houghton College in Houghton, New York. I grew up in Erie, Pennsylvania, which is one of the snowiest cities in America. <laughs> some of you may know, um, about 10 minutes from the shore of Lake Erie. I remember as a kid walking home from my bus stop and I swear passing snowbanks that were at least as tall as me, if not taller, and bundling up to go outside and play football and build snow castles with my family in the winter. Um, for the past four years, I have been attending Houghton College, which is about an hour away from Buffalo, um, very much an hour away from Buffalo and I've been able to experience beautiful forests, um, very clear skies full of stars and breathe some of the cleanest air in the world is where um, to this day Letchworth Park is definitely one of the most beautiful places that I've been able to see and luckily that's only 30 minutes away from my school. But even over my short 22 years of life, I've witnessed a change in weather patterns and quality of these beautiful places that I call my home. And to think that myself, my peers, and potential future generations won't be able to experience um, these beautiful pieces of creation that I've been able to experience is devastating to me. Um, it's truly heartbreaking to know that in my young life alone, I've already seen changes such as, you know, dry and warmer winters and wet, cold summers. And it scares me a lot to think of the potential of what else I'll be seeing in my lifetime. So for these reasons, I believe it is absolutely crucial that we act on climate change while we still can. Thank you for listening. And thank you for sending us that video. Um, keep practicing your stories. Uh, you don't have to record them and send them to us, right? Um, if you do want to, please keep doing that and send them to quakerlobby at gmail.com. We'd love to hear them. But just keep practicing either in the mirror <laughs> or maybe to whoever you're stuck in self-isolation with. Um, just make sure that you're comfortable telling your story for your visit. So with that, oh my goodness, we are at the end of our time together um, on this main webinar. Just to be clear, we have more content for you all. But for right now, uh, we are going to kind of shift gears to workshops. Um, so like I said earlier, and I'm just going to try and make it even more clear now, if you get on fcnl.org slash slw, um, you should immediately see the schedule. And then down at the bottom, you just scroll until you see the workshop that you're interested in. All of the workshops are held on different kind of uh, videos that you can just click on and then start watching. And if you have questions, all of these will be on YouTube. So it will be the YouTube chat function that you can use to ask questions. Whoever is monitoring the workshop on kind of the back end will make sure that the presenters are getting your questions, just like we have been doing for the last two days. Uh, so we have a lot of awesome workshops to choose from. I hope you all heard something that was interesting to you and that you spend the next hour and a half uh, continuing to develop your advocacy skills and gaining more perspective on why you might care about the climate uh, crisis and addressing it now. These are unprecedented times, friends, but there is one thing we know for sure. Your voice matters more now than ever before. And we cannot wait to hear how your lobby visits go tomorrow. Happy lobbying. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Bye, everyone. Thank you.